DiscerningHearts.com presents St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. Mike Aquilina is a popular author working in the area of church history, specializing in patristics, the study of the early church fathers. He is the executive vice president and trustee of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, a Roman Catholic research center based in Steubenville, Ohio. He is a contributing editor of Angelus Magazine and a general editor of the Reclaiming Catholic History series from Ave Maria Press. He is the author or editor of more than 50 books, including St. Joseph and His World, the book on which this series is based. He has hosted 11 television series on the Eternal Word Television Network and is a frequent guest commentator on Catholic Radio. St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome back, Mike. Thanks for having me back, Chris. We're going to explore the expression of the faith within the home of the Jewish family. And in particular, we're going to visit a scene for many of us we're familiar with, if you pray the rosary, the finding in the temple. And you give us a whole new way of looking at it, looking at it through Joseph's eyes. So thank you for doing that. Well, it is a curious incident. It's there in Luke's gospel. It's a kind of a troubling incident. You know, we don't like to think about things like that happening. A child being separated from his parents for three days. Wow. You know, you think about what the parents went through. What an ordeal. And it ends in such an enigmatic way. You know, mm-hmm. they don't really come to terms with what just happened. And you know that their relationship has changed from that moment. You know, we're we're just left to imagine their life afterward because we really don't have any other incidents from our Lord's adolescence. It's important to set the stage of what's leading up to this. There might be some out there who reflect on this and say, well, they didn't realize he was missing. How could you not know your kid was not with you? Mm -hmm. But this was an enormous, important moment for this family, and they entered into a pilgrimage practice for generation upon generation. And there was so much more going on here, wasn't there? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we have to put this in the context of the lifespan of a Jew at that time. We have our own analogs for these things today. You know, today, when we're raising a child, we expect them to take on more and more of the practice of the faith as they get older. There are certain behaviors we'll tolerate at Mass in a three-year-old that we won't tolerate in an eight-year-old or an 11-year-old. We expect that the child will advance in decorum and piety as they get older. And it was the same way back then. The child was eased into the religious life of the nation, the religious life of the culture. So they would have been trained to read the law and the prophets. That would have been a training that happened in the synagogue. It's quite unlikely that they spent as many hours in a classroom as we do today because children had to contribute to the family business. They had to do work in ways that we don't expect from children today. But they certainly spent some hours being trained to read and to write and to figure, you know, to to do some basic mathematics. Jesus would have undergone all of this in his, his early life. By the age of 12, you were expected to take on an adult's role in the community. Because you might be married off at any time after that, you know, it was it was quite possible to be married uh, as a as a young teenager back then. You were certainly expected to be doing an adult's share of work in the family trade at age twelve. In terms of the law, it was then that you were expected to observe the entirety of the law and also to contribute monetarily. To the life of the synagogue and to the the taxes at the temple. You were supposed to be doing these things at that age. So I think that's kind of the backstory to what we encounter in the story of that trip to Jerusalem, because Jesus is coming into his own. At this point, he's expected to go to Jerusalem because all adult males were expected to make the three pilgrim feasts every year. So this may have been the first time that he made this trip. And so it may have been the first time that Mary made the trip since she was his mother, because often the mothers stayed back at home with their children while their husbands went and fulfilled the precept of the law. 
So this was kind of a historic moment. It was a rite of passage in the lives of, of parents and in the life of a child. He was moving on, coming into his own, and he was expected at this point to learn what were the, uh, the duties of a male making the pilgrimage. But after this point, he was expected to be a fully functioning member of Israel, a fully functioning Jew, observing the whole of the law. And when you talk about maybe this is the first time that they've gone, we can recall from our previous conversations that this trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem, it's a long one. It, it is. It is. And uh, there would have been many people thronging the roads because you would have had people coming not only from the outlying regions of Judea and of the other lands that comprise the Holy Land, but you would have had people coming from foreign countries. Okay, think of that scene in the Acts of the Apostles at the Pentecost, which was another mandatory pilgrim feast in Jerusalem. Well, they say that there were people from all over the place, Parthians, Medes, Elamites. You know, there were people from Cyprus there. So people really did make a long journey in order to be there in Jerusalem for the feast as the law mandated. So gradually, as you got closer to Jerusalem, there would have been a greater and greater throng in the road, all of the traffic going in one direction. I remember my brother-in-law telling me about what it was like when he went to Woodstock back in the 60s. And he said that the traffic pretty much took over the highway in both directions because there were so many people trying to get to this mega concert that was happening in New York State. Uh, so you can imagine that every year this would have been the case in Jerusalem. And of course, there was a premium of space in the city because the population of the city swelled to breaking point so that it, the city itself could not quite contain all the pilgrims. People had to stay in the suburbs. So economically, it was a, a boom time for the city and for the suburbs. And I'm sure that many people made their living planning for these pilgrim feasts, planning for the accommodation of the pilgrims and selling them their sacrificial lambs and other things that they might need as they traveled. Because of the accommodations and the needs for that, you would probably, like so many of us do, you, you start pairing up with your kinsmen, your, your family, other family members or people that you know. And so this group that they made the pilgrimage with is a, probably a very large one. Yes. I, I mean, Nazareth itself was a town that was peopled mostly by members of one clan, the Davidic clan, uh, the, the descendants of King David. So it was family, and there would have been the people going from your town. They would have started out on the road, either on foot, on the back of donkeys. Uh, so they, they would have made their way. Some of them would have brought their own lambs for the trip. So then you have to go at the pace of the lamb. Um, so that would have been happening. And along the way, you probably met up with other people you knew, uh, you know, friends from other contexts. Joseph probably encountered some of his clients from his business as a carpenter along the road, and, and maybe even distant family members from other villages, you know, because there were other villages peopled by the, the clan of David. So there would have been uh, extended family members on the road as well. You would have amassed a crowd of, of friends and family as you went your way. And how exciting it was. I, I love the imagery you help us to see in uh, the approach of the city. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, the Wailing Wall, like you said, is today is 60 feet high. And that was just the re one of the retaining walls. <laughs> yes. So the, you know, gradually you would have seen the temple come into view and the city come into view. And it would have been amazing. I mean, think about it. When the, when the apostles make this approach, and from a distance, they could see the stones of the temple at gleaming, gleaming in the sun. And, and it looked so beautiful. They, they pointed it out to our Lord. You know, this would have been the experience of the pilgrims approaching. And of course, there were certain songs that they sang. Now, when you have these, these great events like World Youth Day, there's always kind of a theme song that the crowd picks up. And sometimes, you know, like when St. John Paul was Pope and when Benedict was Pope, you had certain chants that young people did when they were at the papal audiences. Well, that would have been the spirit of pilgrimage that happened back then. There were certain psalms that were sung along the way. So all the pilgrims knew the melodies. All the pilgrims knew the words. They could take up the song and all sing together as they made their way along the road. 
Jerusalem just swelled with the number of people. There were so many there already. The people of Israel were like the Catholic Church. Here comes everybody, you know, Mm -hmm. and there were all kinds of people who lived in the lands of Israel at that time. There were all kinds of people. It took all kinds. And they were all on the roads those days. And they were all headed to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. This is where you really helped me, Mike. Because in all my years of praying the rosary, and especially all that time spent in the finding in the temple, I didn't appreciate what was happening prior to this, in that Jesus is going with his father to help offer the sacrifice, offering the lamb to the priests for sacrifice. Yes. Wow. At, at this age, at this age, he is, he is along for the purpose of learning how to be an adult male so that he could one day lead the Passover himself. So he would have gone along with his dad to have the lamb sacrificed in the temple. <laughs> Again, you're thinking of this in the context of its fulfillment of Jesus as the lamb uh, who will be sacrificed. But this is the moment when he's kind of coming into his own. He's learning that from his father. He's learning about a certain degree of fulfillment. He's learning about the fullness of the type. So he's going to the temple with his father. He's bringing the lamb along. He's celebrating the Passover Seder meal with his father, and he's taking an active part. You know, a young son would have been there reclined at the table with his father. And the normative size was at least 10 people at table for the Passover meal. So you were supposed to take in people from outside your family if your family wasn't big enough to to fill the table. You were supposed to provide a place for the poor and those who didn't have family because Israel itself was the family. So they would bring in others. But a child of that age was expected to take an active part in the meal in that he would ask the questions about the meaning of the elements on the table, the various courses of the meal. What is the meaning of the bitter herbs? What is the meaning of unleavened bread? You know, what is the meaning of the lamb? And his father then would tell him the meaning of the individual elements of the meal, because each element had a profound symbolic meaning and a profound historical meaning, okay? Why is there unleavened bread? Well, because Israel had to flee Egypt in haste, and there was no time to wait for the bread to be leavened. This was done in a hurry. So all of these elements of the meal, as I said, had a certain symbolic meaning that Jesus would have had to draw out from his father, you know, asking the questions that Joseph would answer. We'll return to St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. From a letter from St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Be strengthened in the Lord in the might of his power. Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness on high. Therefore, take up the armor of God, so that you may be able to resist the evil every day and stand in all things perfect. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of justice, and having your feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace, in all things taking up the shield of faith, with which you may be able to quench all fiery darts of the most wicked one. 
and take for yourself the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. With all prayer and supplication, pray at all times in the Spirit, and be vigilant in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology is a nonprofit research and educational institute that promotes life transforming scripture study in the Catholic tradition. Founded by Dr. Scott Hahn and with current Vice President Mike Aquilina, the Center serves clergy and laity, students and scholars with research and study tools, from books and publications to multimedia and online programming. The St. Paul Center welcomes you to their free online studies. Whether you're studying scripture for the first time, looking to take your studies to a higher level, or whether you're ready for advanced training, you've come to the right place. In addition, for each track of study, they recommend books that will enhance your study in prayer and build your library of essential works in biblical theology and spirituality. The studies are free. Just visit SalvationHistory.com to view a complete library. We now return to St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. And this moment is so profound, really, because it's Joseph, not Mary. She had to stand back from this. He brings him into the temple. He brings him into this moment. He's handing him into what will become his more priestly role that will fulfill all salvation. I mean, he's the one that is bringing him into this. Wow, what a compelling very tender moment for us and for Joseph to really see that with his father handing Jesus into this, this change. He's witness to the change. Yeah, yes, you know, we're, we're accustomed to thinking of Jesus' last supper as his first mass. Well, this is where he learned to offer that meal. You know, the last supper was a Passover meal. And so this is where Jesus learned to conduct the Passover Seder that provided the context for the Mass, ultimately. This is so important. You know, at the time, the first century, there was a tradition of reciting a certain poem during the course of the Passover Seder. It was called the Poem of the Four Nights. And according to tradition, the four great nights in the history of creation, the history of the world, were all marked on the same night, and they were all the eve of Passover. The first was the act of creation itself, that creation itself took place on the 14th day of the the month of Nisan, the Hebrew month of Nisan. So it's the Passover. And then the second great day was the offering of Isaac by his father Abraham, the Akedah. This was the second great moment, and that also took place on this day of that month. The third great date is what we remember as the Exodus, the Passover, the liberation of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And that also took place on this night. Uh, The fourth great night was to be the meal of the Messiah, the banquet of the Messiah, the night when the Messiah inaugurated the redemption of Israel. And that also was to take place on the eve of Passover. And of course, that is when Jesus inaugurated this new Passover at his Last Supper by establishing the Eucharist, by offering his body and blood in a sacrifice that would be consummated on the hill of Calvary. So all of this has its its mysterious root in that scene that we encounter in the second chapter of Luke's Gospel that scene of the loss of the child in Jerusalem and the finding of the child Jesus in the temple. All of this is going on between the lines of that story. This is what was taking place in the moments that Luke doesn't bother to mention, because people at that time who were reading the gospel or hearing the gospel proclaimed would have just assumed this action. Once this is completed and it's time to go home, again, people are wondering, how could you lose your son if you're traveling together, even if you're in a caravan? This must have been a pretty large pilgrimage as people are beginning to exit the city and they're on their way. 
you give us a sense of parenthood in a, a very busy section, you know, trying to, to navigate out. It can happen, can it? Uh, right. Uh, you know, Jesus was among friends, among family, and he would have been gone for long stretches of time. Yes, this can happen, and it probably did happen, because you kind of just assume that the family members who are all kind of hanging together are watching out for your kid. Uh, but still, you can imagine the panic. You can imagine the shock when they realized that nobody there knew where he was. And then think about what it would have been like to fight the outgoing traffic, to try to make your way through that moving throng, but going in the other direction. That would have been terrible, and it would have slowed them down. And of course, that is one time when you don't want to be slowed down. You need to, to find the child. You need to rush. You need to, to kind of throw yourself headlong into this, and you can't do it. I, I cannot imagine the agony of those parents at that moment. It must have been terrible. Unfortunately, nefarious figures will harm children. They, they do it today. They, they did it then. So that even those thoughts, it, you brought out, it, it, even Joseph remembering the, the story of another Joseph oh. who was taken and sold and given away. I mean, all these things could have been running through their mind. That's right. That's right. They were worried about their child because they knew that these dangers are real. They're real in every culture, every society the real in every time and place. And so they were hurrying to get back to the big city so that they could find their child. Of course, the streets would still have been thronged with people who were there for the festival. You know, there were people who would have lingered in the city for longer because they have business there. There were people who would linger in the city longer because they had family there. This is just the way things work. You can see this around our own holidays. If you go to an airport, for example, the crowd of travelers is brisk for days after a holiday. It's completely understandable how this could have happened, that in the exhaustion, I mean, just the emotional exhaustion of both he and Mary. That's right. How did I fail? What did I do wrong? This is almost like a passion in a way in trying to find the child, not only the child that you love so much, but the one, they're all special, but they're entrusted to you by God. And in whether it's Jesus or it's one of our own. I mean, it, it's that agony. I mean, it really is an agony, isn't it? Well, it was. It, you know, we can be sure of that and we can hear it in Mary's plaintive voice, you know, when they finally do come upon their child. And you can imagine that they would have asked questions of everyone they saw in Jerusalem. Have you seen such a child? And eventually they probably would have happened upon someone who said, oh, I saw a child like that. He was lecturing the teachers <laughs> in, the, in the temple. He was, he was giving the elders these, these wonderful lessons. And they would have said, well, that sounds like our kid. <laughs> yeah. You know, they would yeah. have recognized the wisdom of their child in such a description. And they would have hurried to the temple where they finally found him. So yes, I, I know you can imagine them rushing into the city, asking everyone they found until they finally heard some word and got some glimmer of hope. Uh, but until that time, it was a, a, a true agony that they endured. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, compelling to think, and I've pondered this so often for so many years, when, you know, the fact that Mary actually says, we have been looking for you. Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. They didn't understand, mm -hmm. you know, and you think about the, the piercing of the heart of Mary in that. It's also one of sorrows in the, the seven sorrows of the Blessed Mother. So what about Joseph's piercing? What about him? Why didn't I ever think about that? This moment, and it's maybe, yes, in trying to find him, but also in Jesus's answer, that could be a piercing for Joseph. Yes, every parent comes to this point in the relationship with the child where we recognize that things have changed, you know, that the child is coming into his own and doesn't quite need us the way he or she needed us last year. We've reached a new stage in our relationship, and there's a certain grief that happens at that time, and it's normal. You know, that we're grieving for the loss of a child as a child, you know, that we no longer are in that role with this kid. This kid is coming into his own. 
and is going out into, you know, to fulfill his destiny. And we all go through that. And I suspect it would have been especially severe with this divine child who's perfect as a child and now will be, uh, you know, uh, go into a, a certain perfection of adolescence and adulthood. There's a certain change in the relationship that takes place at this moment that we have to appreciate uh, in the, the lives of Mary and Joseph as parents. It would have been a seismic change for them. And I think it's, it's driven home by our Lord's words. It's, it's driven home especially to Joseph. When you were teaching us more about the actual action that happens in this meal that's shared during the Passover, that moment when someone will ask a question and then the father responds, isn't it interesting? Here's the moment at this point. Now the ones who are asking the questions are the religious leaders and it's Jesus who's answering them. Uh, yes. Within- yes. You know what? You brought up a, a good point and I want to, I want to mention this, that now when we observe our Passover, which is the mass, we look at the essential action as the narrative of institution, when the priest says, this is my body, and he does so in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. But he says, this is my body. This is the chalice of my blood. And what we see happening there is the same thing that would have happened in the earlier Passover, where the child would ask the meaning of the elements of the the sacred meal, and then the father would respond, or the rabbi would respond with a definition of those elements and a revelation of their significance. So what we have there is the revelation, the definition that Jesus gave those elements in the context of a Passover meal. He was doing the same thing his father had done when he was a child, the same thing he saw his father do when he was a child, the same thing he learned from his father, but he was doing it in this renewed form in this new form that he would bestow on us and entrust to the church as a sacrament. And there's so much more that you've given us in this chapter. I encourage people, if you just even want to be able to pray in that tremendous mystery deeper, you got to get St. Joseph in his world. And I do have to also thank you as a, as a quick footnote about footnotes. Your footnotes are fantastic. I mean, (laughs) as far as if you want to go even deeper, it's very generous of you to share those. Um, not only as a, a as a point of giving credit in certain areas, but also as a, a way for us to dive deeper into these teachings. Well, I want people to know that this isn't mere speculation, you know, that, that mm-hmm. this is based on real history. So much of what we hear about St. Joseph, or at least so much of what I heard about St. Joseph when I was growing up, was based on legend. It didn't have the, 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 the kind of grounding in history that I've, I've come to prefer. And so I want to demonstrate that when I do try to imagine something or when I do make some kind of speculation, uh, I'm basing it on solid history. I'm drawing from the work of reputable historians. And so it's all there in the footnotes. And I hope people will follow those footnotes and get into the reading of these serious historians themselves. It only allows you when the time comes. So for you in your prayer, again, whether you're praying the rosary and it's a fifth joyful mystery or whatever that might be in scripture, you have enough solid background to allow yourself to enter the scene and then to be touched by it in whatever way God wants to use that. And I think that's what your work does so beautifully, Mike. Well, thank you, Chris. That's what I'm trying to do. I am not a scholar. I'm not an academic. What I try to do is take the work of the great scholars and make it accessible to ordinary readers, lay readers like myself. And me, (laughs) your average pew person. (laughs) Well, I'm happy about that. Okay, great. I can't wait for our next conversation, Mike. I'm really looking forward to it. You've been listening to St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. To learn more about this subject, you can purchase the book, St. Joseph and His World, on which the series is based, visit scepterpublishers.org, the website for the publisher, Scepter Publishers. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore to hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. Or you can find it in the Discerning Hearts free app. 
This has been a production of the Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will please pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our effort. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com. And join us next time for St. Joseph and His Growth with Mike Aquilina.